Thank you for the kind introduction as introduced. My name is Yong Jin Jung from Yansen, Korea. Well, you know, ICH guidelines are not a funny topic, but we have a several days of the training and we have a lot of people here who have been participating in this training session for many uh, days. And it is not easy to deliver the content of the uh, guideline in a very entertaining uh, way. And when it comes to the E10, it is about 35 or 6 pages. So I do not believe many of you actually read from one page to the uh, end page of the guideline. So I actually captured the actual text of the guideline but I did it on purpose because it's really e not easy to read the guideline text personally. So I just want to share the actual text of the guideline during this presentation. And after my presentation is the uh, lunch hour, so I will be very concise. So for the study design, I actually delivered many presentations on the study design. And I think Many of you are coming from the experimental area, randomization, control, blinding, parallel or crossover, superiority or non-inferiority. I think you understand quite a lot about these basic concepts, but today I will focus on the control and uncontrolled part. The guideline itself is already translated into Korean, so if you are not uh, familiarize with the English text, then you can find the Korean version of the guideline from the MFDS uh, or the um, NIFDS site. So when we say whether this person knows clinical trial or not, when people say clinical experiment, then this person does not know a lot about the clinical trials. So for this human body, even for the animals, we cannot do the experiment. And another question that I asked to people if I want to understand whether this person knows about clinical trials or not, I ask, do you know what C means in RCT? Well, people may say C means clinical. However, when we say RCT, the C means control. So this is the kind of a gold standard of clinical trial. So the control group is really important in the clinical trial. For example, let's say we have like hypertension patient. So we do have the treatment group and then history of blood pressure can be measured. And the baseline was 140 and it changed it to 130. Systolic BP has been reduced by 10. Then we say we did a treatment and then 10 decrease was observed, and therefore the result or the outcome is clinically, clinically significant. However, let's say we have the placebo control group here and then do the randomization. So the same result, I mean the for the baseline 140, for the placebo control group, we also see the decrease to 130. If that is the case, the effect that we observed in the treatment group cannot have the 10 effect size. It should be 5 effect size. So without the control group, we can, we sometimes can over empathize the effect of the treatment group. And that's why we always have to have some kind of a control group. Another case would be, I actually take the article from the newspaper. This is the wrapping advertisement of the bus. So here, there are three groups for the athletes' foot patients, laser mono, ointment, and the combination of the laser and ointment. And after three months, 78.3% of the laser mono group and 12.2% of the ointment group and 80% of the combination group showed effective. So, Rager is important. That's what this advertisement says. So rather than uh, doing the treatment with the ointment, you need to go for a razor. That's the copy 
of this advertisement. But here, in terms of the control perspective, the standard of the care for the f l a t s food is antifungal agent, the oral agent. That's the standard. But here, the standard of care is not included. That's one problem. And also, when it comes to treatment or the drug, we usually think about the drugs to take uh, orally. So if you say rather than drug, you go for leisure. If you say so, in the advertisement, usually people believe that, well, I am taking uh, the drug. Now, if that is the case, if the advertisement copy is right, then I need to uh, stop the drug and then go for the r a g e r So it's kind of a very misleading information. So the copy here need to be very clear, like that rather than ointment, go for r a g e r So when it comes to the control group, it has a lot of uh, impact. like ethical aspect and also the analysis or the bias in the result and the type of the registered patients and endpoints and the types of the endpoints and the reliability of the result and acceptability of the regulatory body. So there are many areas where the control group can have some influence. So this is a very critical decision to make in the uh, study design. ICHE10, if you look at the uh, purpose of the guideline, it says that for it provides the general principle in uh, making the choice of the control group and the designs and the conduct issues will be discussed. So choosing the control group, as I talked about, I talked about the standard of care, whether we have the standard therapy or the sufficiency of the evidence in the design and ethical aspect should also be considered. So the purpose of control group is whether it is a symptom or a sign or other morbidity, we discriminate patient outcome. We need to discriminate patient outcome, whether the outcomes are caused by the test treatment or caused by other factors. Although it is not usual case, but the course of illness may not be very uh, predictable. So the course of illness is not very clear. So historical control, rather than the concurrent control, we can use the historical control if the, uh, the course of illness is predictable. But most of the cases, that's not the case. And that's why we need to have the concurrent control group. The concurrent control group is chosen from the same population as the test group and So the test group and the control group are from the same population and therefore they can be similar with each other. So whether a treatment drug is injected or the control drug is injected, that's the uh, difference. But most of the cases, other than that, they are similar. And in order to achieve that, actually, we need to uh, think about randomization and blinding. So test group and control group. are very similar at the start of the study. And in order to do so, we need to do randomization. And during the study, they need to be treated and they need to be observed similarly. And that's why we need to do the blinding. So randomization and blinding are important concepts for the concurrent control group. So when we look at the original articles, table one is always the baseline characteristic. The baseline characteristics are randomized into two groups, the test and control, and then they are similar. The baseline uh, characteristics are statistically uh, similar, no difference. That's the basis for the control group. So always the table one for the paper always discuss the baseline characteristics. So randomization and blinding, the guideline provides a bit more details.
So they need to be assured uh, to be similar in task and control groups, and that randomization is the way to do it. So randomization avoids a systematic difference between the groups. And what is important is that known and also unknown baseline variables can be similar. They cannot be uh, identical, but statistically, they can be similar. And during the observation, the groups should be treated and observed similarly during the trial, and that's why they need to be double-blind. And by doing the double-blinding, we can minimize the potential bias during the trial. So it can reduce and prevent subjective assessment and decisions. And starting from section 1.3, the guideline discusses the control in details. The type of the control is important, the placebo control or non-treatment control, and different doses, low-dose control, active control, and if we go for the randomization, then there is another way for the randomization, and also the concurrently controlled, and that is called as a like external control. Usually, they are the ex uh, historical control group. So all in all, we have like five types of the control groups. So the first four are the concurrent groups going through the randomization, and the fifth one would be the external or historical control. So we have like five control types. So I will talk about them and then talk about the strengths and weakness. The first one would be placebo concurrent control. This is most important control group. So the study participants are randomly assigned to the tested treatment or to an identical appearing treatment that does not contain the tested drug. And of course, the trial need to be uh, double-blinded. But when it comes to the control, it means like in Korean language, it means like comparison. Yes, that is important. But at the same time, the control here means controls over two things. One is plus the placebo effect, the control for the placebo effect so that we can differentiate the net effect. And the second would be control for all potential influences that can impact on the end point. So the control has two meaning here, like the control for these kind of effect and also the compare, the, the possibility to compare. So in the placebo uh, concurrent control group, usually we focus on the difference of effectiveness, but at the same time, we also try to observe the differences in the uh, AE, which is the safety issue. So placebo-like safety uh, profile. So we often use that term, meaning that there is no difference in terms of the safety compared to the placebo control group. So when it comes to the placebo control group, it does not mean that there is no treatment at all. Like hypertension patient, they may not be given the drug, but the lifestyle changes can be done. And also standard therapy can be provided to treatment group and the control group together. And the study drug can be added on to the treatment group. For the ethical issue, it's kind of a common sense acceptability, ethics, and the feasibility are the potential issues for the placebo control group because we do have the effective treatment, but people are involved in the placebo group, and then the doctors need to recommend uh, their patients to participate into the study where the placebo group will be formulated. And and another point is that during the study trial uh, duration, the treatment can will be delayed. So whether it is pain or whatever the symptom is, the treatment will not be given for the study trial, and so the treatment is delayed. And that's a, another part of the ethical issue. So as I said, being a part of the placebo control group does not mean that there is no treatment at all. Palliative 
for the treatment for the uh, cancer patient, analgesic treatment or the injection for the cancer treat patients, or the standard therapy is really clear, then that is provided to both groups and the study drug is added onto the treatment group. So there are variations for the uh, placebo control group, three arm trial. So three arm trial include active control as well as a placebo control group. By having that active control group, we can see the differences, not just uh, with the placebo, but also the standard care active group. And of course, we can try different doses. So we can see the differences depending on the doses, not the differences, not just the big differences between the treatment drug and uh, the placebo. And we can also have the flag, uh, factorial design. We do have the study drug A and A plus and B and others. There can be a simple factorial design A1, A2 doses, B1 and B2 doses. Then we can do some combination of those doses going for the factorial designs. Randomize the withdrawal. I have not done it. So I'm not sure whether you have done it before or not. So the active treatment is being provided, but at a certain point of time, randomization is done. So, so one group maintain the treatment and the other group receive a placebo. So the active treatment is withdrawed, withdrawn. So in that case, so the effect of the active treatment can be demonstrated how uh, how long that effect can be maintained so like episodic or the recurring symptoms or the diseases like depression uh, the relapse prevention study can be done for that kind of uh, symptoms and pain and zina and others symptomatic signs how well the symptomatic signs were uh, suppressed or sometimes let's say the hypertension do we have to take the drug forever? So withdrawal indicates the drug is withdrawn and then mor morbidity and mortality can be assessed. For the randomized withdrawal design, two randomized withdrawal des uh, designs. Here we have test the drug and active competitor are compared like 12 months of treatment. So at the end of the treatment, uh, there is a randomization again. So active, the maintaining active comparator and placebo for the tested drug, the same is applied. So started with two groups, but at the end of the day, we have four groups. Let's say uh, antiviral drug. So we want to address, understand the suppressive effect. In the placebo, there can be recurrence like after three months of the uh, end of the treatment, there is a recurrence. In the test group, there is a recurrence, but usually it's a longer than like six months. So even though there is a recurrence, but the time to relapse is longer for the test drug group. So it can show indirectly that the test drug is more efficacious than the active comparator. So many different informations can be uh, garnered. The ICHE12 provides a guideline on the antihypertension drugs and the randomized withdrawal dry design is also recommended. So here you can see that for a long period, long term, the treatment drug is provided. And when and also the when the treatment is stopped, then the the tested drug effect can be also verified from many different perspectives. And now we talk about the advantages of the placebo controlled trial. First uh, advantage is that it can demonstrate the efficacy. Concurrent control, this is the concurrent control, but at the same time, they are the internal controls. And therefore, we do have a very clear comparison to placebo. And it says absolute efficacy, meaning that that effect or app the real efficacy. So what it means is that we can really understand the effect of the treatment, the real effect of the treatment. And for the AE, sometimes there are some underlying diseases or the background noise 
with the patient that can lead to the AE. So we need to distinguish the AE from the treatment or from other factors. And the effect size, the test drug, and the active control for that, Actually, the effect size would be larger than that, and therefore the sample size can be smaller. So that's efficient. So for the patients and the investigators, we can at least have some certainty that there is a 50% chance for being randomized to the uh, placebo. So the true drug effect of tested drug can be detected. But still, on the downside, there is an ethical concern, and therefore the patients with a severe illness cannot be participating in this type of a study control. So mild to moderate type of the patients are likely to be part of it. This because this involves the placebo, the this should be the short term study. And we the patients need to think about the possibility of being a part of the placebo treatment and therefore there might not be easy or strong acceptability on the patient side. And because they know that there is a chance for the person to be a part of the placebo, they might withdraw the consent. And the registered patients may not reflect the real world. The severe patients, whether it's a protocol or by the doctors or by patients, these patients with the severe symptoms may not be included. They can be excluded. And therefore, the total population of a certain disease cannot be represented in the study. And without the active control and with only a placebo control, then the effect comparison, direct comparison between the test drug and the standard treatment cannot be done. Of course, there can be some indirect information. So the second part would be no treatment, concurrent control. Well, you may be thinking that is it possible to have that kind of a control? Well, for me, I have never done a study including no treatment, concurrent control. So the randomization is done here. But one group does not receive anything. What's the difference between no treatment and taking placebo? No difference, right? Some people may say that. But here, there is no intervention, and therefore the blinding cannot be done. So the whether the investigators, assessors, or the patients, they should know they, uh, there is no blinding. So this is not a typical case. So this study design can be done only when there is a situation where the blinding itself cannot be done. For example, the bl even though there is a blinding, but toxicity is so strong so that the tested drug group will uh, experience the toxic event. So if that is the case, there is no point having the plasma group. And or the endpoint is so objective, like pain or mood swings, they're subjective. But endpoints are so objective. And other factors do not affect the endpoint. For example, the cancer patient, even though they have more hope, hope than before, that doesn't mean that they get better. So if that is the case, then the no treatment concurrent control can be an option. So that can be done for the clinical trial, but for the evaluation, the participants and the, the investigators, the doctors know that there is no blinding, but the assessor, the evaluators need to be blinded at least. Third, dose response concurrent control or low dose control. There are several fixed dose groups and the randomization is done to these different dose groups. The placebo group can be included or not. Usually the double blinded. Usually in this design, there is a placebo active control. It can be there or not. If we have a lot of participants 
and then the period or the duration for the study will be uh, lengthened and the cost will be incurred more. So whether to have the placebo or active control or not, that's the decision that the sponsor need to make. And for the PK concentration, the different patients have different concentration. So sometimes the titration can be done by looking at the PK concentration or like once a week or every day injection. So that kind of the regimen, different regimens can be compared to. You can see 1.3.3 and then the next section on the slide is 2.3. The reason that we have, uh, we do not have the subsequent number here is that there are so many introduction sessions. So I, I just took out the introduction sections and then provide the sections only for the different types of the control. So the next control type would be the dose response concurrent control. Well, there can be some advantages to include a zero dose group. In those binding study or in those ranging study, depending on the dose, usually we do not have a lineal result, although we want to have that. So PD, well, PD is not linearly increasing uh, to the dose. So for all doses, maybe the similar effect can be observed. Low, medium dose, we can see increasing effect, but at a certain point, we can see some flat graph. So is it really the case that all doses are equally effective or equally ineffective? So by having the placebo group in the case, then it's better for us to interpret the result. And when we have the placebo group, we can take out the effect of the placebo from the uh, study drug. By doing so, we can have the net effect of the tested drug. And also, so the difference of the effect between tested drug and the placebo and the difference of the if effect among the different doses that need to be uh, compared. And therefore, the when the effect size increases, then the sample size can be reduced. So in order to identify a very, very small effect difference, then the sample size need to be increased. And you can see the advantages and disadvantages of the dose response trial. Those response were those ranging trials we can understand efficacy and also the overall dose response information. It can be like linear or flat or have some changes depending on the dose. So this kind of various information can be garnered. From the ethical perspective, let's say uh, if we do not have the placebo in the design, then we are randomized to, the patients are randomized to the tested drug, although the dose may be different. So low dose, the effect may not be that strong, but safety would be good. And for the disadvantage, well, what would be the effective dose? That's uncertain. And sometimes we can see no difference between doses. And sometimes there are cases where the therapeutic range is not well known. So the trial dose may be too high or too low. So while we're doing the 2A trial, we usually confirm the therapeutic range and in 2B phase, as we move to the phase of three, in 2B, one or two doses or the dose ranges are set. And fourth type would be active control respiratory or the cardia, actually we do have a very good standard treatment. So it's not easy to do the placebo control. So in that case, active control is used. So you may be thinking about non-inferiority uh, margin and double blind is usually applied, but at the time, the double blinding may not be always possible. So for example, onco, the regimen can be different. Some person need to take the uh, pills or the oral medicine, others the injection. So 
for the plasma control, the double blind is a must, but here the active control in what group the participants is involved, treatment is in any way is given. So it can be go for the open label. And the phase of three sometimes can be done in open label, particularly for the oncology trials. So for the active control, there are two objectives, non-inferiority and superiority. This is not about like approval, it's more about the head to head phase four. That would be the spirit trier. And if it is for the approval, then non inferiority in the phase three. In uh, the active control trials, the advantages are the ethical concerns can be reduced from the patient and physician's uh, perspective. There is not much of a concern, and therefore, that is more likely to have the approval from the IRB, and uh, we can recruit more people. Cardiovascular trial, usually we need to have like 30,000 people, so we need to have a large samples. Then the active control trial design is more uh, advantageous, and usually for the dropout, we think about like 10% for the dropout. So for the active control uh, trial design, the dropout rate will be uh, lower. And for the information, the efficacy, larger sample size, and therefore the safety information uh, can be collected more. And as for the disadvantages, there is no direct assessment of effect size. When it comes to the effect size, test the drug and the placebo, the test group effect need to be sub subtract, uh, subtracted by the effect from the plasma group. But here, the comparison is between the test drug and the active drug. So if we have a plasma group in this design together, and that would be the best, but this is not usual uh, way to do it. And also, the as for the AE, because we do not have the plasma group here, it's not easy to quantitate or to quantify the safety outcome. The large sample is good. It's easy to recruit people. But at the same time, the non-inferiority margin, if for the non-inferiority margin, the margin needs to be set. And if it is, it has to be set for the approval for the phase three, then it should be very conservative, meaning that the sample size should be larger. And for superiority trial, the comparison is with the active control, not the plasma. And therefore, the margin is really, really small. Though so between the test and plasma, the difference between the test and active would be smaller. And therefore, the sample size need to be larger. And external control for the onco or the rare disease, the external controls are uh, widely used. This is the external control. Usually, let's say the external control can be a group of patients treated at an earlier time. So this is a kind of a historical control. But at the same time, it can be a group treated during the same time period, but in another setting. But practically speaking, it's not easy. So usually the external control means the historical control many times. For the external control, it can be very defined control group. And for example, a very similar result from the very similar trial. Only difference is the time point. But it's not easy to get that. So it may not be clearly defined. Like a registry, you know what registry is. Let's say this is the lymphoma. There are many different subtypes of the lymphoma, and the registry includes all the different subtypes, so it may not be very well defined. And the baseline controlled study is we do have the test group now, and then before and after is compared. For example, the blood pressure is something now, but after eight weeks, the blood pressure is reduced to what? The tumor size now is this much, but like eight weeks from now on, the tumor size is decreased to what? So so there is, this is kind of the baseline controlled uh, studies. And there is no internal control and the, for the externally controlled. So the baseline control means that the patient itself becomes the control. So sometimes this kind of a design is needed, like external controls can be utilized. For example, 
the treatment effect is dramatic. You know that anesthesia is very dramatic. The cardioversion, you can see that the difference or the changes. You can see immediately the change and also the tumor shrinkage. So this is the cases where the external control can be controlled, can be considered. However, many cases, the specific historical control need to be identified. I have only two minutes, so I will just wrap up. So for this uh, external controls, there can be some possibility for bias. And as I said, the randomization is a way to minimize bias. The test group and the uh, control group sometimes uh, may be very different. So randomization sometimes cannot be done for some ethical reasons and other reasons. So extreme level statistical value, like very low p-values, uh, confidence interval is very small or the effect size is very large. So these things need to be considered. So because of the bias, the external control design, as I said before, let's say the, uh, the treatment uh, effect is really dramatic or the endpoint is really objective. The baseline treatment variables effect are not strong on the endpoint or well characterized. If that is the case, then the external controls can be possible. So the active controls uh, advantages for the rare disease, there are not many patients. The, this is about external control, not the active control. The advantages of the externally uh, controlled trials, as I said, especially for the rare disease, do not we do not have the many uh, patients. But at the same time, the blinding is not possible, and the bias can occur in many areas. So these are the advantages and disadvantages of the externally controlled trials. I just want to share one thing more, the synthetic control. The external data is used, but at the same time, we do have the baseline, similar baseline characteristics. So in order to PS matching or propensity uh, matching need to be used in order to match the baseline characteristics. So the statistical methodology can be utilized in the synthetic control. And lastly, we can also have like the multiple control groups. Well, because of the time constraint, I cannot go in details. But what I want to say is that we need to have a comparison and therefore the starting point need to be a fair. So endpoint need to be very clear and the doses and everything need to be very well defined and fair. I'll say sensitivity, although well, because of the time constraint, I cannot explain the assay sensitivity, but I recommend you to read the text. So these are the factors that need to be considered in order to maintain the assay sensitivity. And the last table shows that in quantifying the absolute effect size, the placebo include design would be the way to go in those response, of course, the those response group an active group if you want to uh, comparison. And here the algorithm you can see, you can just see it. And there are many different examples actually. So the different cases. So the algorithm cannot be absolutely applied to every situation. And I think after listening to this presentation, you may think you need to read the guideline, but the guideline is not easy to understand. So for your understanding, I think this book will help you a lot. The chapter 16 and chapter 17 actually cover what E10 guideline talks about in easy word and in uh, very detail. So rather than uh, reading the ICH E10 in English, it's better for you to understand or to read this book, chapter 16 and chapter 17. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.